firstly, welcome. My name's Ian Thorne. I'm the chair of the Friends of the Marden Valley, uh, which is a relatively new organisation dedicated to defending, preserving, uh, working with all sorts of other groups and organisations and local residents to protect and enhance the Marden Valley. Uh, I'm also, for my sins, uh, a member of Calm Town Council, uh, and also for even greater sins, what did I do wrong in a previous life? I'm a member of Wilkie Council as well. Um, now, uh, I think we've got about 20 plus people with us this evening, right. which I think which is, is a, started. a really fantastic turnout. I know uh, my friend Robert McNaughton was worried it might just be me and him, um, but uh, which would be an awful <laughs> set, of, set of circumstances, but it's not, which is fantastic. So what I'd like to do to just open the conversation We've got three fantastic presenters, but I'd like to invite Robert just to say a few words of welcome. Uh, I think he will then invite uh, Nikki and uh, Nikki Jones from um, Avon Needs Trees to say a few words. Started. And then we'll head on to, I'm just going to ignore all the background noises, uh, and uh, then we'll move on to our oh uh, speakers for this evening. So over to you, Robert. Thank you, Ian. Just a few words about the Marden Valley. The Marden was some feedback there. Feedback. The Marden Valley is a wonderful place, little known, uh, but, but to be cherished and looked after. It starts in the high hills of Wiltshire, way above Carn, where it's all chalk, and then the water trickles down from there through Quemerford into uh, Carn, and then out down towards Black Dog, which is a place we're all going to hear about tonight, uh, I think at least from Nick. And then it goes to uh, Hazeland. Hazeland is the place where you have your site. And so the water that starts in the, in the chalkland comes to the clay land of Hazeland. Then it goes on down to Stanley. Stanley is very famous for having been a Cistercian. Um, oh, there's, uh, there's been Cistercian Abbey, which started about 1150 and then closed down with, under the Henry VIII's rule about 1535. But it was a hugely important place. It's just a mile down the downstream from the Hazeland site. And kings and queens came to stay there, which they no longer do. After Stanley Abbey, the river goes down past Stanley Bridge. And then it goes into the Marden. Sorry, the Marden goes into the Avon, just to the west of Titherton Lucas and to the east of Chippenham. The Marden has got the usual problems of rivers in Great Britain. Uh, phosphates, glycophosphates and poo. And I feel quite indignant that Pooh these days should still be discharged into the rivers. And just a heads up for you that the Bristol and Avon Rivers Trust on their website is a link to um, and suggestions about the private members bill, which is going through Parliament the 16th of November about taking Pooh out of the river water. If you could uh, look at the BART uh, website and write your local MP, I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nikki. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Um, well, I just want to say, since this is the first collaboration with Friends of the Marden Valley, thank you very much for setting this up, Robert. I really, really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who's come. I think maybe everyone needs to mute generally, if, if you're not already muted. Um, just uh, to say, many of you will know, but it, just in case you don't, Ava Needs Trees is a new charity. We started, uh, we registered last year, July 2019. We've now bought Hazeland, which is 34 mm. acres, almost 34 acres, um, as we'll come on and explain, right in the heart of the Martin Valley. And we're now looking to buy our second piece of land, which is closer to Melksham. So really we're looking to buy land to plant and rewild to create new permanent forest uh, across the catchment area. Um, and, you know, Hazeland in particular is just such a wonderful site because we've got that river frontage, uh, we've got a lot of wet woodland because of that uh, river frontage and because of the canal there, and um, we're also, of course, close to the railway, and then we've got some wonderful ancient forest, which is very neglected, and then three fields which we're going to plant and rewild. So lots and lots of opportunity there to do great things, and we'd really like to see you on site. If anybody hasn't signed up for our mailing list, and would like to. It's the best way of finding out what we're doing um, and the events that we're planning coming up. Um, and particularly if you're interested in the biodiversity of the valley, then uh, please do sign up and you'll, you'll hear about all our different surveys and, and how we're progressing on that. And we need people's help. We need citizen scientists to help us with that. And we will certainly be co collaborating with the Bristol Avon Rivers Trust on water quality testing uh, and uh, everything else relevant to this area. So 
I won't waste much time. Perhaps just to say very, very cheekily, we have one day left of our crowdfunder to help us buy the second piece of land, it seemed. Um, so if anybody gets off this um, off this event tonight and feels really motivated that you'd like to run away and uh, give us a, you know, a huge amount of money or even a little bit of money, then please do look up our, our crowdfunder these trees on the crowdfunder site. Um, and we'd be very, very, very grateful for that. But I will I'm shut up now and uh, hand over to our speakers. And I, can I just say, actually, oh, is particularly cut the crap. <laughs> interesting noises off. Um, it is particularly good for us to hear. I think it's for us to put Hazeland in the context of the wider valley. <laughs> is that a television? Or is that a uh, anyway, okay, so uh, anyway, okay, I will hand over to others. But, uh, but I'm very pleased that we uh, Avon East Trees are part of this event and we look forward to many more. And Nikki, thank you very much for that. Could everybody please mute? Um, it is fun to hear somebody else's TV, um, but I would rather have heard Nikki more fulsomely than the uh, whatever it is, the latest episode of, of I'm trying to show my age now, Neighbours or Emmerdale or something like that. So Nikki, thank you very much indeed. I think that we at uh, uh, the Friends of Marden Valley are very, very excited by what you guys are doing at Hazeland. Um, we're very keen to get involved, particularly around the public engagement consultation, uh, reaching out to groups and organ organisations and audiences in the town and in the wider community. So it's really great to have you. And indeed, I think some of your team and colleagues here this evening. Uh, I'm now going to pass back to Robert, who's going to do a big build up to each of our speakers. Uh, and I think Tim's up first. So, uh, Robert, over to you for the big build up, please. OK, well, just a couple of words. Tim is a historian. He's a published author. He works in the he works with the Khan Heritage Center and he's going to he's in the process of writing a book on the Marden Valley. And he's told me he's looking forward very much to to give his talk tonight. Uh, Nick is a, a historian from Khan. He's the Wiltshire history man. He's very enthusiastic about all history. Uh, but tonight he's going to specialize on the, the train section and uh, the words black dog and um, uh, Stanley Holt will come into his vocabulary, I think. Alan is the talk supervisor, talks leader for the Wilson Barks Canal. He went out recently and found some rain, remains of the canal down in Stanley. And uh, uh, I've asked Alan to talk as much as he can about the canal that goes through your area, but he'll give a general introduction before that. So thank you very much, Tim, it's your turn. Thanks for that, Robert. I'll just share my screen now. Sorry about this, uh, there we are. Okay, hello and thank you for joining me for this talk, uh, covering the brief history of the River Marden. I'm coming to you from the Khan Heritage Centre this evening, uh, where I've volunteered now for a few years. Um, after publishing my first book, Khan Place Names, um, I turned my focus to other areas, one being the River Marden, um, which I've researched now uh, just for about three months. Um, and I'm hoping to publish my research in book form in around 2022. So uh, this talk will cover a few areas of research to give an overview of the usage and importance of the River Marden over time. So first we'll look at the root of the River Marden and then cover the geology and the wildlife. Then we'll talk about the town of Khan, which is the biggest settlement on the River Marden. Then we'll uh, look at the Doomsday Book and it's mention of the mills around Khan. And then we'll look a little bit deeper into the mill at Calston, Horsebrook and Stanley Abbey. Uh, then we'll look at other uses of the Marden before looking at the floods that frequently happened. Um, and then we'll go on to more happier things such as the leisure activities on the Marden before looking finally at the groups and organizations that we're fortunate to have looking after the River Marden and the Marden Valley. 
Um, the River Marden rises at the west end of Ranscombe Bottom near Carlston Wellington. Then it flows in a westerly direction for about eight miles uh, through places like Blacklands, Quemerford, Carn, Studley, Hazeland, and Stanley before joining the River Marden at Tillerton Lucas. Along the way, it's joined by many streams, including Rivers Brook, which starts up at Cheryl, um, Abbott Brook, which starts from various places around Compton Bassett. Then we have Fishers or Bevers Brook, um, which starts in the Hill Martin area. Uh, Cowage Brook starts from many places um, as far as Lynham. And then we have Wetham Stream, um, which starts um, from around two farms, uh, both in Stockley. And finally, um, Pudding Brook uh, issues from uh, Studley. There's much history along uh, and in the Marden, including the mills, factories, crop growing and sports and leisure. Um, the Marden and its tributaries flow past four medieval settlements uh, and now scheduled monuments, including that of the medieval Bettersbrook village. Uh, Wetham Stream uh, notably flows up through the Grade 1 listed Bowood Park and Garden, forming the lake that is very well known. The River Marden, emerging at, Bring at Springs at Ranscombe Bottom, um, is part of the North Wessex Down area of national beauty. This area was created to protect one of the largest tracts of chalk downland in southern England. And the chalk is part of the zigzag chalk formation, which was formed between 94 and 101 million years ago. As the river moves um, towards Khan, the land turns from sandstone and limestone into the Oxford clay formation. This clay contributed to many floods in Khan, as we shall see. Uh, the river flows primarily through agricultural lands. However, there are settlements along the river, the largest being Khan. And one of the earlier settlements uh, was the Roman villa near the springs of Riversbrook in Cheryl. There have also been many finds um, through the river from the Stone Age up to modern times. Perhaps these periods of activity show the potential seen by earlier people of the river and the valley. And there are many species of plants, animals, fungi, etc., recorded along the Marden Valley, from otters and kingfishers to orchids and ragged robin. And this mandarin duck is one of a group that likes to sit in the trees up at the Horsebrook Nature Trail. And many people post images or reports to social media of species that they've seen, and it's clear that people enjoy being around the river and the fields in the Marden Valley. However, improved access and education about the river may help to increase species recording using tools such as I record. And this would allow us to get a more detailed and accurate understanding of our river environment, which may then impact future developments. Um, Khan owes its existence to the fast flowing stream of the Marden, which likely protected the original settlement on three sides. Uh, with similar settlement patterns seen in Chippenham and Wilton. As we can see in the image at the top right, um, that's the estimated um, settlement pattern as Khan began to develop. Um, it's expected to have begun with a royal, a royal settlement, with a church site within the bend of the river there. And uh, as it expanded, it then went on to the other side of the river. Um, Marden um, means boundary valley and it was one of the boundaries of Chippenham Forest. And it also used to go by the name of the River Khan. Khan likely means meeting of water or current of waters. And its name was probably taken for Calston too, as they share the same river. As early as 1086, the mills in Khan are being mentioned. We can see that there were nine mills recorded and they had a value of five pounds, 12 shillings and five pence. And these mills powered many industries from Calston down to Tiverton Lucas over the ages, an excellent example being Hazeland Mill. This was originally part of Malmesbury Abbey and used as a grist and tucking mill in 1534. When the Bainton family of Spy Park held the freehold, it was used as a cloth mill before returning to life as a grist mill until around 1965. These days, um, it's well known as being used for a B&B. Between the 12th and the 19th century, Khan's economy was based on the woolen cloth industry, and it brought Khan to particular importance as a home of the woolen industry, uh, which included places such as Bradford-on-Avon. 
Some early names that gained wealth and power here were the Chivers and Foreman families, showing the importance of this industry. A member of the Foreman family subsequently became Lord Mayor of London in, 90, uh, in 1538, while clothier John Noyes became MP for Carn during the first parliament of James I. As you can see in this image, um, at the top right, this is a storyboard that we have here at the Heritage Centre. Uh, we have lots of information here and it's well worth coming when we're back open again, hopefully next March. Um, it gives lots of information about the woolen industry. Um, and while it was still going strong in Cairn, thanks to the River Marden, up to 15 of the mills of the Marden were involved in some aspects of the cloth trade. Unfortunately, the industry went into decline in the first decades of the 1800s. The industry that would help Cairn rise up again had already begun in 1770 with the opening of a small butcher's shop. The business, which itself would come to span the River Marden, employed a large part of the population of Cairn, and it became the world famous CT Harris Baking Company. Before we move on, though, let's look at some of the mills in more detail. Of the five mills that occupied the Marden at Calston, Upper Mill was located closest to the source of the Marden. This mill had a varied life as a pulling, grist and cloth mill before being rebuilt as a paper mill. However, the mill was demolished in 1882 to make space for the reservoir that was so dearly needed during the epidemics of typhoid fever and diphtheria in Khan and the surrounding area. In 1923, to defend their rights to the Marden's water, the Khan Mill Owners Association was formed. And it's the only known association of its type in the UK that was created out of the fear that water taken from the reservoir um, would lower the water of the Marden and impact their businesses. The association safeguarded an adequate supply of water and protected their rights to that water. And it lasted until the 1970s when it was dissolved as there were no longer any water mills on the Marden. As you can see in this image, uh, the reservoir is well used by swans these days and also angling. Uh, Swadden or Horsebrook Mill is in an old area of Cairn called Horsebrook and it dates back to the 1600s and it was run at one time by the Swadden family. The mill was sold and converted a few times in its history before being rebuilt by Joseph Bailey in 1822. When he built it, he built a five-story factory, the biggest in Cairn at the time. The 9,130 square foot factory was thought to have cost around 4,000 pounds. However, when Joseph retired in 1849, it was purchased for less than 500 pounds. Even worse news followed in 1861, when the factory, at that point, the first flax mill in Wiltshire, was devastated by fire. One boy actually lost his life in the fire. As the building was only partly insured, 50 people less, lost their jobs after this. In 1867, the owner, Mr. Thomas Large Henley, was declared bankrupt. Now, he was quite a curious character. After this event, he enlisted around 30 farm laborers to emigrate to Uruguay for a scheme to introduce flax there. That scheme also failed and his whereabouts went unreported between 1871 and his death, which was registered in Fulham in 1912. It seems that he never returned to Cairn. The Horsebrook Mill was used for storage as a grist mill during the 20th century. However, another fire in the 1930s destroyed the third floor and eventually the mill was converted into flats, which is how we see it today in the image. Stanley Abbey was built on land given by Empress Matilda in 1151 to monks from Court Abbey on the Isle of Wight. The Abbey contained perhaps the earliest fulling mill in Wiltshire and one of the earliest in England. Now fulling, also known as tucking, is a step in the woolen cloth making which involves cleaning the cloth to remove oils, dirt and impurities. The second part of the process involved the matting of fibres to make the cloth thicker, stronger and increase, increase waterproofing. And it's possible that at one time there were two mills on the Abbey estate. However, there may have been a single mill which served as a combined fulling and corn mill. The operations at Stanley Abbey came to an end in 1536 when the Abbey was dissolved. Now this illustration at the bottom right uh, shows the mill race and the mill 
and part of the building works at Stanley Abbey. Now, it wasn't just Mills that used uh, the Marden. Uh, up at Carlston, watercress had been grown since medieval times. Beds located at Tog Hill, uh, which was land held by the Marquess of Lansdowne, um, the watercress was sold door to door until recent times. And between Rivers Brook, uh, which is the, the brook that flows down from Cheryl to Cannon in Castlefield, and there were several withy beds used for growing and coppicing of species of willow. The height of the water was controlled by sluice gates. The bridge in the photograph um, would have had wooden slats inserted on the upstream side uh, to hold the water back, with the circular hole on the right-hand side of that image um, allowing excess water to carry on down the brook. Around Hazeland and Stanley, um, irrigation in the form of water meadows was implemented to increase productivity. This was done until relatively recently with at least one metal aqueduct still in place. The canal will be discussed later on by Alan. However, I'll just mention that water from the Marden was used for intake um, for the canal. Uh, there's likely always been flooding in the area of Khan. A combination of Rivers Brook and Abbott Brook joining the Marden near Khan, as well as the clay and mudstone bedrock were likely natural causes. And then people started building along the river adding weirs and sluice gates, dumping rubbish, uh, things like that, and which probably made the situation worse. The earliest flood that I could find reported was that in 1725, in which two men actually drowned within sight of their neighbors, who were, of course, unable to save them. Uh, there were many other floods uh, between 1818 and 1932. And the 1920 flood uh, was particularly hard um, on C&T Harris. Not only did it put out their furnace, where it washed away building material. Uh, this was during the time that the iconic factory, still so well known in historic images, was being built. Uh, the floods would often cause much damage to shops and houses. And in 1932, 50 houses were flooded, with the flood also causing damage at the swimming baths, which put them out of commission. Changes to how the sluices were operated, gaps introduced along the wall at New Road, and more recently, floodgates have helped lessen the danger in Khan. And when we had um, a high river in 2018, uh, there were no breaches onto the road, although it did get very high. Along with angling and the old canoeist, there are many leisure activities on the Marvin. Uh, recently, uh, we've had the addition of a pop-up pocket park alongside the river near Sainsbury's. This follows the river along Beach Terrace and into Castlefields Park. And at Castlefields Park, there uh, are many walks along the river and the canal with plaques uh, of wildlife for the kids to make brass rubbings, plenty of exercise equipment, and a few informational boards to help people interpret the area. There are also plenty of benches and natural areas for people to sit and enjoy the river. However, the most anticipated leisure event is the annual duck race organized by Khan Lions. This generates a lot of enjoyment and funds for charities. And hopefully when the duck race takes place next year, we'll have our first uh, River Marden Day too. We're very fortunate in this area to have many organizations and groups um, looking after River Marden. Within Khan, we have the Castle Fields Canal and River Park a group that look after the park and waterways. They introduce many uh, attractive elements and work with many organizations to achieve their goals, which uh, in the past have included backfilling the Khan lock and installing dummy gates, along with the installation of a replica narrow boat in 2011 and 2012. Uh, River Warriors Khan also do excellent work, particularly along the Abbott Brook. At the moment, they're in the process of creating a wildflower area. We also have the Khan cleanup crew, which along with many individuals, uh, collect rubbish along the river. And in the wider area, the Bristol Avon Rivers Trust uh, do fantastic work. Um, the results for their 2020 water blitz just came through, which saw 313 people take samples of river water in 266 locations. And the results showed a decrease in the average phosphate concentration for the first time, along with the decrease in the average nitrate concentration 
which had been increasing in the previous two years. Unfortunately, um, it also saw an increase in um, litter pollution. I took um, recordings at three different sites along the Marden, and the worst example of the litter I saw was a shopping trolley, which unfortunately was removed swiftly afterwards. So to conclude, we have seen that the river and its tributaries and the valley it runs through have been used since very early times. In the late 1800s, the Marden was used to bring pure water to the people of Khan and the surrounding area after much illness. This was fantastic because it eventually meant that all the wells, which would frequently become polluted, were concreted up and no longer in use. And there's been a lot of industry in the area, particularly the mills that um, use the water for power. The power then translated to a strong economy and the emergence of powerful people in Khan. And while there have been many floods over the centuries, the river is seen as a place for leisure these days. However, it's important that the entire river and its tributaries receive appropriate protection and care. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much indeed. That's fantastic. I have to say I was I mean, feeling super, super happy about the reduction in the phosphates and the nitrates, and then you hit us with the shopping trolley, Tim. But uh, uh, I, I think I'd take the, the latter, even if I had to take the former to some extent. Uh, qu questions for Tim, if you would. And if, can you, if people can put their hands up electronically, then I can actually see all of you. If you don't, then I can only see a small number of people on my screen. So if you're able to put your hands up electronically, that would be extremely helpful. And he says, just looking for anybody who's putting their hands up. Maybe Tim's presentation was so beautiful. Well, I think it probably was beautifully complete that you've absolutely stunned all of us with your knowledge and details. I can't see no, anything. Ian Derrick's put his hand up for uh, Isabel's partner. Then Derek, fire away, please. Derek, do ask your question. It's got the sound on, Ian. Sound off, I mean. Go. Oh, I think you've got your mute on, uh, Derek. Sorry, um, sorry about that. Um, I'm right. Derek McCord, uh, live in Stanley at the bottom of Bencroft Hill. Um, from our house, we, we look across to the canal uh, to the east and uh, the river to the west. Uh, and frequently we walk around the river. Um, now, thank you very much. That's been excellent. Um, but it, you haven't mentioned Scott's Mill. Um, and Scott's Mill seems to have been operational. Um, I've um, transcribed a, a will and... Um, that mentions Scott's Mill back in 1690. So clearly it's been a mill for some time. Um, any thoughts on that? No, to be honest, I realise it's a very long mill, but it's not an area that I've gotten to research so far. But it's definitely more than some of the rest. I think it's an area for Tim to do some more research at some point then, I guess. Yes, but, um, um, Right. Yes. Uh, I mean, there is there's one other point at um, Scott's Mill area. There is a, a small bridge, um, which was part of, I guess, the, the mill race. And it's being very overgrown. Uh, and my fear is that um, if that's lost, totally, we're, we're losing a little bit of history at the, at the Scott's Mill area. The rest of Scott's Mill has been demolished and um, uh, and the spoil taken away. Is that the bridge over the Marden or over Puddingbrook? That, that's actually on the Marden, um, but the bridge is on the Mill Race, which um, is on the, the west side of the river, on the opposite side from the, the current building that's called Scott's Mill. Thank you. Um, if, if you would like me to show you it at some time, at some stage, uh, I'm quite happy to do that. Oh, that. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Derek. Are there any other questions 
the tomb. I think the answer is no, but Tim, thank you very, very much. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And uh, uh, if only the watercress wasn't still being delivered door to door, I think I'd be very keen to buy it, actually. Uh, maybe we can speak to um, the Marquis of Lansdowne and ask him about that at some point. 